So, so I would, I would start with saying like anyone that eats or has ever eaten or has ever touched or thought about food is affected by the farm bill. Right. So, so this is not like, yes, it's huge, but it also affects everyone. It's incredible that I'm glad you mentioned a moment ago farm bill because it seems, I, I'm assuming complicated, complex. Um, so what I would love is that there's a really good chance for better or worse that a whole lot of people have never even heard of this necessarily and don't realize how much it affects the average consumer and much more importantly, the farmers cr producing the crop that gets us to that section. And so if you can just, in the most general way, explain the farm bill, because I, I feel like you're doing a lot of effort into it. And I just want to get clear on what it is and how it's affecting you. Right. Yeah. I mean, the com complex is, is probably an understatement. Um, and, and again, my background is not in political science. <laughs> so I'm, I'm coming into this a few years and learning as I go as well. Um, so there's there's 12 titles to the farm bill. Um, and each title then covers certain specific areas. And it's a humongous package, a lot of money, and must be bipartisan. So in prior times, though that was challenging, it may have been less challenging than in current times. Um, is that just because but, politics are currently so explosive and dramatic? Or is it just the, the way things are? Right. Right. No, I, I think I think the former. Okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We've <laughs> we're in an interesting time. Um, so so I would I would start with saying like anyone that eats or has ever eaten or has ever touched or thought about food is affected by the farm bill. Right. So so this is not like yes, it's huge, but it also affects everyone. So the the by far the biggest portion of the farm bill is the is SNAP benefits. So supplemental nutrition assistance program and WIC. So there's a lot of, of money there to support folks that, that really need help finding nutrition. So that's a big piece. Um, and then there's pieces around conservation. So there's a lot of conservation programs that farmers are eligible for to either take land out of production or say fence off waterways so their livestock aren't polluting waterways. There's um, increasing the biodiversity. There's a lot of different programs within the conservation title. There's also um, there's also programs like NRCS, the National Natural Resource Conservation S Service, um, where, where there's technical assistance provided to farmers. So a farmer's like, hey, I'm having this issue. I don't know what to do about this or that. Then they reach out to their local service provider in that way. And then there's also research that is funded through the farm bill. And so I didn't go through all 12 because frankly, I, I don't have all 12 of them memorized and I don't have a cheat sheet in front of me, but there, there are 12 different titles. Um, but for, for what we've really been pushing on are a few of those pieces. One, we find that technical assistance is one area that's severely in some cases lacking as far as how farmers can have an option of regenerative organic farming. So for us in the North Coast of California, our service providers, our university, a lot of the folks, our, our farm advisors are, are well equipped and understand multiple systems of farming. So organic, regenerative organic isn't necessarily new to them. But there's plenty of areas in the nation that are, you know, a huge acreage of farming, whether it's row crops, commodities, specialty crops, whatever it is, that maybe don't necessarily have a background or a great understanding in organic or regenerative organic. So that's one area that we've been advocating for is increased technical assistance because farmers, just like anyone else, we only do what we know, right? So if we don't know another way, we can't be expected to do something differently. So we really need to increase increase the education, I would say. Another area that's hugely important is crop insurance. So that's an, another title. And crop insurance has the capacity to incentivize farmers to, I would say, make better choices in how they farm or not great choices in how they farm. But a lot of that is incentivized. And so 
formerly crop insurance has really been <clears throat> has been constructed, I would say, in some ways to to support. <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Um, more of a, a monoculture, like a corn, soy, big commodity, big acreage, single crop monoculture. And we've seen through many years now that that's not the best approach to having a, a long-term viable food system within our nation. And so if crop insurance can incentivize polycultures, using cover crops, having diversified farm systems and a more holistic approach. And that's one way to really move the needle as far as our impact as a nation on farming. And then another area that we've been pushing on is, is research. And so we find that institutions, universities and such are amazing at doing research and they'll do research on essentially whatever the questions are, but where there's funding. So if there isn't funding for organic research and organic production systems, then there's not a whole lot of research behind that. And what we see is that there's such a small, such a minimal amount of funding put towards organic research. However, the organic industry, at least domestically, is like $63 billion, right? It's humongous. Um, and, and this is within all of our states. We have organic farms and farmers. And, and not only that, but... Organic research is has the capacity to touch all farmers, right? So, I mean, as we've seen with, say, cover crops and compost utilization, some of these things that were like only for organic farmers, you know, way back when, now we find farmers, whether they're conventional, organic, whatever, they're using cover crops, they're using compost. So organic farming research has the capacity to be available to organic and non-organic farmers. Whereas conventional farming research is really more specific to conventional farmers, because a lot of times you're looking at active ingredients, you know, which are prohibited in, in organic production. So so there's a, a huge need, I would say, on the research side. And then finally, one piece that we really see as a as an issue now, but especially into the future is just land tenure and land access. Our farmers are, you know, I don't know what the, the stat is at the moment. Average age of farmer, depending whether it's a nation or a certain state, is at like 60, 65, you know, maybe 59 if you're lucky, but not young necessarily. Um, and we also find that that a lot of families, when they have children, the children are moving off the farm, right, for plenty of good reasons. And we also find underserved populations not able to access farmland to be farmers. So we really need a, a better system of how farmers can either stay on the land to have a viable future in farming or how people, younger folks and disadvantaged populations that want to farm have access to funds and land to be farmers. Um, so those are really, I mean, there's plenty of things to to work on, but but those are kind of our, our bigger priorities right now. There, There's two details in there I'd love to touch on. Let's start with the technical knowledge of Bonterra has hosted, I'm going to call them, I, th I think you mentioned field days, showcasing mm -hmm. presentations, bringing together community events of growers, promoting experience sharing. What are some of the lessons you took from those days? And what are some of the things you noticed happening those days, the good and the bad? Yeah, yeah, that's great. What, what I find um, through a few years now, many years, I guess, is that farmers as all of us, if we're going to make a change and that change has a significant consequence on our livelihood, we really want to be able to speak to peers and other farmers and to see it. And so research is great. Scientists are incredibly smart, but farmers don't also always necessarily listen to a scientist to tell them how to farm. Farmers would much rather have kind of peer to peer conversations because farmers know what farmers are are facing, right? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes research has to be structured in such a way to try to eliminate all variables or whatever. And, and it, it, not always, but sometimes it doesn't necessarily match with the conditions that a farmer actually sees in the field, you know? Mm -hmm. So so what, what we've done for, for many years now on many different topics, but hosting these kind of field days, like you said, and inviting our neighbors, anyone within the county or the, the surrounding counties 
to join us, whether we're like, hey, here's a piece of equipment that we're trialing, or here's some practices that we've been doing, and here's the results, here's what worked well, here's what didn't. And so then you really get, I mean, experienced, knowledgeable folks that know what you're talking about and know the issues to really just say like, okay, well, what about this? You know, did you consider this or what happened when this happened or whatever? And then when, when you can see it, when you can go to the field and actually see that practice or that equipment or whatever it is being utilized and the results of it, then that, um, I guess, uptake of that process or, or whatever it is really, really, I think is, is, is much improved versus, trying to look at some graph or, you know, going to some university presentation where they're like, I, it, it seems, you know, the P value on this is 0 0.05, you know, that's, is that good? I don't know the statistics that, you know what I mean? So it's really kind right. of more real in that way. And so that I think helps the adoption and, and it's a bit more, more real to talk about the challenges and the successes um, and for people to be able to just actually see it in the field. I, I like that. And I, I, I from a, an experiment, experiential point of view, I can absolutely see the value in that. Um, a second thing you brought up is, and you brought this up in Philadelphia as well, and it blew my mind and it made complete sense is the long-term vineyard planning, the replanting, the costs of replanting mm -hmm. and how the practices you're encouraging, not only can it be better for the environment, but it's better for the bottom line. So can you right. talk about that practice, the efficiency behind it, the budget behind it, anything you like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's great. There's there's often a debate, I would say, on on kind of farming systems. So it's I'd say it's it's a myth, but it's a myth that needs correcting, is that organic farming is more expensive. And so I think it it's that's possibly true in any given year. However, if you look to, well, a couple things, if you look at the true cost of farming, which we don't look at, you know, organic farming versus conventional farming, what is the cost of clean air, clean water, clean soil when it's gone? Like, I, I don't know that we could put a dollar on that. So, so, but let's set that aside for the moment, just because that's a really complicated issue and we haven't quite figured out the economics of that even yet. Um, so so <clears throat> putting that aside, if we consider that we're farming more for the long-term and it's more of a long-term investment in our land, then if we can extend the life, the, the productive life of a vineyard, just a handful of years, then that translates to an increase in the bottom line. So roughly rough costs, and this changes year over year and, and equipment, I mean, yeah, well, equipment and materials change, but let's just say roughly on average, $30,000 an acre for a replant. So per acre, right? And you're not gonna get a viable crop for at least three years, if not five years. So if you're pushing a vineyard with, um, I'd say more synthetic chemistry <clears throat> to get higher yields, but you run kind of the lifespan of the vineyard out, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, quickly, then, you know, if, if a vineyard can only last 15 years, then you're replanting another 30K per acre every 15 years. That's a huge hit. Um, so if you can extend that to say 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, then the economics right there is, is pretty obvious that that is a better investment in in how you farm. And I think at some point, it's if we just take a step back and we think how we treat the land is really like a, a, a relationship. We're entering into a relationship with the land. And so if we consider our own personal relationships, right? If we say... I'm with this romantic partner and I would describe that relationship as sustainable. I I don't know if that would indicate you get some roses and some chocolate or you need to go to counseling, right? That that doesn't sound awesome to me though. So it's just like we'll we'll just continue. <laughs> but <laughs> su sustainable is not a great adjective for <laughs> a long-term romantic partnership, I would say. So in this way too, I think like 
this idea of we're just sustaining isn't really beneficial to the long term. So if we consider how we treat our land, if we're if farming is a long term relationship with the land, our plants, if they're perennials, our workers, our people, right, we're really trying to invest in a long term, healthy, strong relationship. And that means doing things now, as far as giving, we have to give, right? And in order for relationship to thrive, it's never 50-50 give and take, right? But at some point, someone's giving more and another point, hopefully the other person's giving more. So there, there has to be a giving. We know that when we go onto the farm as farming, we're taking, right? That's what farming is. It's it's quite <laughs> exploitive, right? We are taking, taking, taking. But in order to balance that out and have a, a regenerative farm system into the long term, we also have to give. And so we give through cover crops, through animals, through compost, through our attention, through like really trying to treat the land and the people well. That's very inspiring. That this again, it's bringing back this brings me back to the feeling I had that night because it's really it's hope for the future. And you're you're investing today into the future. And I like your uh, comparison with sustainability. So as we wrap up discussion on the farm bill, what are the next steps there? And can the average foodie, wine lover, consumer do anything to help the farm bill, to help Bonterra's initiatives in the farm bill? Yeah, 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 definitely. I, I think um, I think there's a few places we can plug in. And, and I think we all kind of just have to do our part. You know, so as as producers, as a business, we try to make sure that how we're doing business has more positive impact than negative impact moving forward, right? So how we treat the land and all the other areas of greenhouse gas emission and, and what is our business doing that has a positive impact for our community, our people, and and expanding the circle out. I think as individuals, every time we make a purchase, we're voting with that dollar, right? So the dollar is a vote for that product, that producer, oftentimes that retailer or store or website or whomever we're buying it from. So right, every purchase is saying yes to all of those things and subsequently no to the things you didn't purchase. So utilizing our dollar as a as a strong vote and voice definitely makes an impact. And then on the policy side too, I think calling your senators, calling your representatives, saying like, or emailing, saying, this is what, as a constituent, this is what I want to see, right? I'm, you can either have my vote or not, but you're representing me. And we really need to come together and to have a strong farm bill that will, will make our country stronger for now and into the future, right? I mean, I remember, I'm old enough to remember the, the, some of the prior wars where we were talking about energy security, right? Maybe we still talk about energy security, but we we're missing the point of food security, right? If, mm. if we don't have a strong domestic food supply, strong domestic farming culture and communities that can create our own foods that are adding health to the soil, the biodiversity, the food itself, right? We're, we're kind of missing the mark. Um, and we've seen that recently, right? With some of these more recent wars that all of a sudden, like we we're so globally connected, but at the same time, like if ships don't get where ships need to go, then we can't be relying on the whole world for our own food needs. So I think, I think knowing that you have a voice Mm -hmm. And that if you reach out, call, email, write your representatives and say, hey, I, I'm expecting you to, to step up and here's the farm bill. And this is what we want to see, like promote these things that are good for the for everyone at the end of the day. So as we wrap up, how can we learn more about you, Bonterra, the wines and the, the farm bill? If we can help in any way, but tell us where we should be visiting, where should we be browsing, where should we be shopping? Yeah, 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 that's great. I, I do think our, our website um, has been refreshed. And so there's a fair amount of information now, how to get the wines. You know, if you can't find them locally, you can order from us. And then there's a, a good amount of information as far as the multiple initiatives. We didn't really speak to a lot of the things, you know, we're B Corp, 
climate neutral, uh, zero waste, organic, like we said, I don't know, there's a whole list of them. So you can certainly learn more there on the website. Um, if you're interested more in the regenerative organic certification, the Regenerative Organic Alliance has an incredible website. So I would go there and learn more about what all those practices are and all the brands. It's a global certification, has surpassed a million acres of certified land. There's hundreds of products now with the license. So it, it's growing quite quickly. Um, and I love to see that. And I, I do think that I should acknowledge the market as far as the marketplace, right? Because what we've seen, and I think probably pushed more from our from our younger demographics is really wanting to know, other than making a profit, what is your business doing for good? You know, what is the positive impact your business is having? And so I think it's really important that these certifications are understood and are known so that people can really support people, businesses that are that are doing a really great job at having a beneficial impact now and into the future.